Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Kaiserreich in which we're playing as the Mingan Insurgency led by Wang Jingwei, basically we're the left KMT, uh, Communist China, or what will be eventually might be considered Communist China, or radically Socialist China. Uh, but right now we've popped out of the Zhe Nanjing clique, formerly the League of Eight Provinces I think, and then the last bastion of Chinese Socialism. Central Revolutionary Base, situated in the highlands between Jiangxi and Fujian province, is one of the last points of concentrated socialist resistance in China. The National Revolutionary Army of Shattered Remnants rallied after the 1932 Shanghai Uprising, clinging to the dim hopes of a free nation. The years have not always been kind to us, thousands of good comrades have been martyred, but we hold on even as the League Encirclement campaign seems to grow closer each year. Return on the second NRA. Upon the completion of the War League, our insurgent army spirit will be replaced as the NRA transitions from guerrilla warfare to conventional warfare. Huh. Taking this focus will also recruit one legion of irregulars in the surgeon zone. Fortify the Mingan zone. That still wouldn't be bad. But they'll return on the second NRA. Once believed to be the army capable of unifying China, the National Revolutionary Army will be split apart during the fallout of the Northern Expedition. After nearly a decade of fighting, the guerrilla war in the, in the Mingan zone, the NRA has returned with its full strength, hoping to carry out one last uprising for, for South Asian. So right now, we've got a couple objectives here too. And actually, I played this way, way, way back in the day when this first came out, I think, but it's been a long time since, and it's been updated, so we're going to be raising some nationalists. And then we're also trying to raise uh, international support, which would be good for organization, breakthrough, and speed. We need to form a national government eventually. We just got access to the sea without a port under control. The KMT government in exile will have a difficulty in returning home. If we can take a port in Fujian province, we can secure a direct route to connect the Mingan insurgency with its exiled comrades, strengthening the revolution. So when completed, we become owner of Xiamen. Xiamen, get stability, some more infantry equipment. Why not? We still have a whole army reform stuff to do, but we'll get there eventually. And we need to secure Fujian province. <clears throat> and we secure the Ganan prefecture. Kuomintang insurgent presence in southern Jiangxi and uh, the provisional action committee's previous work in gaining the approval of local peasant groups meant that the German Oganan region can be easily secured by forces. Already various insurgent cells are primed to strike. We're ready to secure the local outlying villages, however. It is vital that we secure the first first secure the league, a stronghold in Gangzhou, before we can proceed. <clears throat> nice. So we're gonna use our horses and try to move up as fast as we possibly can to get to uh, Nanjing and whatnot. Ooh. Xiong Tiao Xiong Qing Tiao declared. Nice. Yes, we'll take whatever we can get. Go, my boys, go. Because they're also fighting Unching, too, so. Happy March, everybody. Can we do something like that, maybe? What is this? Social Republic of Italy. Oh, yeah, that guy looked really disgruntled. Um, of course, discipline. Petition for the international aid. Seek to reach out to our friends and comrades in the Third International for aiding our national revolution. If they accept, huh. Applying the follow up effects of the agreed to send more support. Since the party's founder, Dr. Sun Yat sen sought the International for aid and recognition organizing the reorganization of the Kuomintang in 1924, we maintain cordial ties with the revolutionary comrades in the International. Let us send a message out and without needing help of once more. Spies and secrets in the League War. In the aftermath of the Northern Expedition disaster, <clears throat> Many disillusioned. Uh, Wampoa alumni scattered or returned to their villages seeking employment in warlord armies or even fighting each other. Uh, or fighting other less savory uh, means of employment. Very few remained loyal to the cause of Mingan and fewer did not seek out ways to augment their income. In the days of insurgency, lines often blur between the revolutionary and the criminal. The League of Ten is a small but growing bunch of gangsters made up of former Wampoa students. A spinner from the Shanghai's Green Gang, led by one Dai Chongfeng. Like many Chinese gangs in the air, they are fraternal, nationalistic, and secretive. Uh, unlike others, however, they retain some affinity for the Kuomintang cause, often a combined covert network for keeping our Mangan insurgency connected with the outside world. This is hardly to say we've not been double-crossed before, or that the League is above playing both sides, so it appears that that dies actually or achieved a measure of prominence in the wake of Sun Chuang Fang's collapsing authority. Shadowy agents have begun transmitting detailed, though sometimes exaggerated or out-of-date, information from Nanjing to our lines. Well, um, interesting to hear. <clears throat> you know what? Okay, well, let's hear it. Oh, I wanted to encircle them, but it doesn't look like we can. I would like to encircle them, but I don't know if we can or not. Oh, we just got encircled ourselves. God dang it. Return to the Central Committee. So, this is not looking very good for us, so we're gonna... You know what? Where are you guys going? 
Are you? You're both going there. This looks awkward and weird. After a long, intense, uh, filled voyage. Oh, you guys want to go there. Uh, the flotilla of ships from the international finally arrived in China. In a daring operation using a mixture of subterfuge and apt planning, they successfully evaded interception by hostile ships in part because of the ongoing fallout of the mutiny in the Maui and the recent defection of critical Fujian naval forces led by Chen Xiaokun and Chen Jilang. At long last, the Central Committee is able to step foot in the Chinese soil once more since their exit in 1927. Only to the ongoing fighting near the recently secured port of Jiamen, Wang Jingwei kept his remarks brief and with little pomp, though the mood of the ceremony is nonetheless one of the great excitement. He and other members of the Paris Space Committee quickly met with the leaders of Mingam to establish a working government, and have been remarkably amiable with one another despite lingering differences. Also disembarking in the formation of European trained Chinese forces, carrying a sizable amount of successfully transported artillery. Trained overseas in their Wampa and exile, they are led by Deputy Headmaster Zheng Zhijiang, Director of the Political Department Zhu Enlai, and Director of the Training Department Hu Zhongnang. Last officer of note is Admiral Li Zilong, who has been commended for his capable naval leadership throughout the operation. Welcome back, Chairman Wang. Nice. Oh, look at this guy. Committee zone. That's actually 20 combo. Nice. That's pretty good. Do you make a segment here? Maybe? Can we go here to cut him off? Ah, look at that. An actual circumvent. Beautiful. Ah, even more divisions, too. Very good. Alright, so I don't think you're going to be able to hear. I need you to retreat, probably. Incidents in Wenzhou. Occupation plans for Wenzhou and other AOG ports have been severely lacking compared to the meticulous steps and lines of advance drawn around Jimin. <clears throat> When NRA forces occupied the city of Wenzhou, spontaneous anti-foreign riots began all across the city, leading to the murders of numerous German residents and looting much of the city's uptown districts. To complicate matters more, several smaller advance groups of nationalist troops also participated in looting until more disciplined units arrived to secure the area. Wenzhou is now significantly damaged from the civil unrest. I know the mess for a foreign secretary to sort out. Not good. Oh, we got the fleet. Nice. Uh, I'll take as much territory as we possibly can, if it's possible like this. This is going to be really ugly. We want all of it, if we can. There you go. The Shandong Massacre. Oh, ma not Massacre, but Menace. Uh, we're going to lose that territory immediately, so we're going to do something like this. The KMT's pushes north have so far been hugely successful, capturing important cities in the eastern provinces. Meanwhile, the forces under Zhang Tehran are moving for the south. Skirmishes between our forces have already uh, happened in different places, yet no serious attacks as of now have occurred that would provoke either side to start fighting across the front. However, both sides know that a war between the two factions is inevitable with both parties wary of the other's growing threat. The Chengqing Tiao Guo is ruled by Zhang Tianran and is based in Shandong, a province known for its coal reserves. Despite having the potential for prosperity, the province is beset by endemic corruption and instability still. A war against Chengqing Tiao Guo at this point in time could prove disastrous for the KMT. The forces are hell bound on destroying the remaining enemies, and finding new one can stretch out our forces, their forces, to be picked in detail by the enemy. The KMT leadership now has to make a choice. Attacking uh, Shangqing Tiao Guo or wait until with the KMT forces are in good order to progress the march north. So fair response. Guys, get up to the line, come on. And we gotta go in immediately. Where is the cab? The cab's already moving in, huh? Turn to the second NRA. Petition for aid. Nice. Attack Shandong. The Shandong government will likely declare war upon us at any moment. We must not let such a dangerous regime remain in power. Huh. Raise men. So right now, who got all this stuff here? Nice. With the death of Sun Chongfeng, the League of Eight Provinces has collapsed in one fell stroke. The winner of the League War should have played a major role in determining China's future, and survived the trial by fire, people have been promised and expect a short, decisive campaign. Morale is a representation of the people's belief in our victory, and their willingness to fight for the victory. With high morale, we would keep rallying the people to our cause and securing foreign support. Morale can be gained through capturing enemy territory and holding the city of Nanjing. On the other hand, the longer the war takes, the more we will seem to fail to live up to our promises. Should morale drop low enough, our troops will begin to defect, and the fighting ability will be severely crippled. Morale can be lost by losing territory and progression of time. It's unbreakable right now. We'll give way more political power. Wow. Way more breakthrough, too. 
Get more units and guns and our ooh, artillery would not be bad to have too. Um, we can't edit any of these guys, but actually getting some artillery would be very nice. 800, 100 units of artillery, 300 units of artillery. Why would you... Yeah, and Nanjing would be fantastic. Two, 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 three. I'll raise men there too. And integrate Jingling Arsenal. The Jingling Machinery Manufacturing Bureau built atop the old Jitian uh, Temple sat by the late Qing Dynasty, or formerly Hongzang, in 1865, quickly became one of China's venerable weapons production depots in eastern China. Referred sometimes as the creator of China's national military industry, became known as for ability to churn out little rifles for the army of the southern Zili clique. Her name, Jingling Arsenal, became the focal point of Sun Chiang Thang efforts to build a modern Chinese army along the German lines. Staffed with German technical or visors, it has been modernized into a production powerhouse for the League of Eight Provinces. Yeah, why not? 9th International Congress, go there. You immediately start attacking that way. There you go. <clears throat> Tragedy Nantong. The port of Nantong had been leased by the League of Eight Provinces to the AOG. Its position as the mouth of the Yangtze uh, allowed it to act as a German exclusive alternative to the international city of Shanghai. The advancement of the NRA towards the treaty port caused mass panic and unrest among many of its residents. Widespread looting by Chinese natives combined with scorched earth tactics by German security forces have lit up the sky above Nantong, and the ceiling fires have wiped out many of the textile factories. An exodus of ferries heading south towards Shanghai were overcrowded and unsuited to trips outside the Yangtze, leading to several of the boats capsizing with hundreds of deaths reported. Before the NRI could do anything to control the situation, it became clear that Nantong was a disaster area. Long seen as an exemplar of how Chinese cities would be modernized, and Nantong has effectively been sacked, a great loss for the country, and Fujianese and Hangzhou. Fujianese. Most of the NRA's first units were raised in Fujian province from local peasants and rare and urban <coughs> native. And if you have any of these regular troops are familiar with the standard Mandarin, a Mandarin dialect. Yesterday, a group of Fujianese soldiers on leave in Hangzhou caused a scene with language difficulties and drunkenness led to a fight with local Hangzhou residents. Despite the view of China's one nation, language difficulties, and the sharp contrast between rural and urban lifestyles, makes stationing most units outside their home area is difficult. It's an unavoidable problem of national unification. Any help here? Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna need extra help here. Beat the crap out of them. Equipment losses. With a series of defeats on the battlefield, morale sunk to new low. While retreating from advancing enemy forces, a group of soldiers sent to bring supplies further uh, towards the capital instead deserted and took the supplies with them. Which represents both the breakdown of the general discipline and a heavy loss logistic situation. Trucks a lot of them. That's not good. Oh, let the French go. Go, 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 French soldiers. Go, boys, go. Third International. France has gone through its designs to hold the Ninth Congress and Third International. We expect to receive an invitation. Foolish not to send a delegation. Better start packing. Go in and around. There's a, that's quite a few divisions, and they're actually decent divisions, too. All delegates have arrived. If you want to do this, please go ahead. Um, yeah. Nice. Inauguration of the Congress. Uh, do I even want to read this? Uh, if you want to read this one, please go right ahead, I guess, for now. Syndicalism of Spain, of course. And heart of the capital, too. So I might actually read in another campaign but for now. Yeah. Helps in Latin America. What's got here? Taking on Jing. How are we supposed to take that in three days? We're going to lose eight morale because we can't move that fast. Oh, morale's. Holy crap, it's falling fast. Women's role in the World Red Revolution. If you want to. Read this, please go ahead. That's fine. You know what? We're just going to go and go with this already. Uh, where is it? Hello? Come inside. Mohammed wants to speak. Oh, we need to be a neighbor of them. District International for Aid. Off Map Civi. Rally the Mass Movement. Uh, that would be better. I like stability, though. As instructed by our late founder, the Kuomintang is led to le uh, lead the oppressed classes of China to break the chains and work together in order to resist the imperialists and the warlord lackeys. Let's rally the peasants in the countryside and the workers in the city to join together and participate in our national revolution once more. Union of uh, Brit uh, sends advisors, as well as the Social Republic of Italy and Communist France. Our cries of help not going unanswered is the Communist France, the Social Republic of Italy, and the Union of Britain sends advisors, or uh, military advisors, to help us in a revolutionary struggle. While we are certainly dismayed that they will not be receiving rifles and ammo, uh, we will certainly appreciate their help in training our soldiers. With a gracious act of help, we will surely be able to achieve victory in the ongoing league war and the free the young sea of the Imperials once for all. You think of European comrades? European comrades? European comrades of my terror. Now, who's going to do this and please your head? World Economic Crisis Third International. 
Well, with the Berlin stock market crash, mass unemployment has risen in Europe and South America, and trade unions begin to grow in size of both result. French and British governments held highly secretive talks, and slowly but surely, one realization came to all. Now might be the hour, now might be the moment. A tremendous effort must be undertaken, however. Well, exactly this tremendous effort would prove uh, controversial. It would be proved controversial. And when the Congress finally resembled for a voting session, the debates lasted well into the night, with positions ranging from issuing a mere condemnation to calls for immediate armed struggle. Ultimately, it decided that a framework for deeper international collaboration would soon be established under the auspices of the Third International and Socialist Great Powers. Help towards the development of ex-socialist economies, greater economic integration, research and development programs, as well as permanent international cooperation and councils will help the world's free nations act as one to prepare for the final struggle. Simultaneously, initiatives to more concretely support socialist efforts in capitalist nations will be undertaken both openly and covertly, neutrally. Details will still be left for governments to fill them, but the proposals are approved almost unanimously. One thing left was to vote on the name of this initiative. A French delegate proposed a Falanstera, an homage to the harmonious and self sustaining communities established by the utopian socialist Car Charles Foray. A proposal which proved instantly popular by building this international Falanstera, Falanstera, Instead of, uh, the workers of the world will soon conquer the utopia they've earned. A decisive opportunity. Ah, oh, the ja Japanese are there too. Look at that. End of the Ninth Congress. Oh. The Ninth Congress, the Third International, has finally come to a close. Uh, rich in events and emotions, having reinforced once again the cohesion of the international social movement and it's set its course for the immediate future, it only be called a success. Uh, the final vote of the delegates concerned with the location of the next Congress, and though many cities were proposed, it was ultimately decided that it would take place in London, the other great socialist capital. Many delegates came forward to deliver their refined remarks and thank the comrades. When they came home, the delegates hoped to grapple the consequences of one of the greatest events since the revolutions. Certainly, an opportunity for decisive action. Uh, before that, a ceremony was organized to properly send them off. Uh, on the Mont uh, Martre Hill, a birthplace of the 17, 1871 Commune of Paris, a great performance opened to the public was given, showcasing the best French artists, regional costumes and traditions, as well as athletic feats and technological innovations. It was followed by an immense banquet of dishes from all around the commune for the many delegates, which lasted well into the night. And of course, the guests concluded this experience a joyful socialist unity in the only way it could have by proudly singing the International. And tomorrow, the International will be the human race. And 30 days. Just keep smashing them as hard as you possibly can. We have a lot of green. We need more green, though. There you go. Got Nanjing back. Screw you, you piece of crap. Pretenders. There you go. Nope. You get nothing. Uh, Sun Liren offers his services, huh? The destruction of the Anjing clique and the fall of Chen Tiaoyuan's anti concessionist movement have left many of its nationalist compatriots adrift. While the junior ranks have most have been either absorbed into the great fa other factions or have gone in to teach at the Green Force School, the vast majority of Chen's senior leadership have either fled to the litigations of Japan or elsewhere they could find employment. Few would even consider joining the ranks, so some would have surprised when he was approached by General Sun Liren and a few other officers and his staff. These aren't have serve an anti concessionist and nationalist cause, he asked for an appointment in a growing armies. A native on, of Ennui. Someone was one of the few participants of the 1919 anti entente protests against the Duan Kyori government as a young man, studying abroad <coughs> at Purdue University. His continued anti imperialism brought him to enroll in the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, graduating just after the end of the Northern Expedition, he was a member of the new generation of officers in China. Given his history and a myriad of other prospective candidates, few questioned if he. If Question asked if we said no, however, his unique training and youthful uh, uh, enthusiasm embodied much of the hopes of the younger generation of the anti imperialist officers. How much more supplies do we need? We're good at supplies. We must all be united. Traitors? Eh, oh, they went to war with us. What about soldiers? A man believes that the victory is close at hand, will fight harder and better, it's often said. Whether or not that's true, the reason battle for success is done that will boost morale as well as having a positive effort in the warfare. Well done. Well, load up on the border, I guess. How about here? Just hold. A new down in Nanjing. Nanjing has been liberated. Gone to the warlord, Sun uh, Chuan Fang and Ji Ji Yan. Uh, the tyrant to stole from the people and sold the city in Paris at long last. Uh, the white sun flies above the city, the dream of the northern expedition nearly a decade ago. In a speech today following the city's capture, a triumphant ceremony honored the late party founder and all the revolutionary martyrs that had fallen over the years. 
but practically it's clear that Kuomintang intends to turn Nanjing into the provisional capital for the duration of the National Revolution already. The former Governor General's Palace, in the same building where Dr. Sin was sworn in as provisional president in 1911, has been converted into a provisional presidential palace. <clears throat> a previous executive uh, of a provisional uh, executive one is being established here as well, so subordinate to the Central Committee, uh, Central Executive Committee, with Zhuang Jingwei as the president of the national government. Like uh, Zhao Zongkai has been appointed premier of the executive Yuan, a new position to serve as the head of the KMT government. Previously, the KMT have begun the first forays in the ruling and organized state. A new republic rises. Nice. Good job, guys. Yeah, everybody, want to join us? Oh, Oswald Mosley, Oswald Mosley, and Mussolini too. Nice. Rally the militias, social democracy. Fortify the Mingan zone. Uh, for years, we familiarized ourselves with the mountains and forests of the Xinjiang and Zhujiang region. During an exile under the bulwark of a new national revolution, with we'll open revolt once more underway, we'll be doing as well to ensure their defenses and fortifications are adequately prepared and hidden for the enemy's onslaught. Yeah, why not? Oh, three here. Because then I want all, but uh, you, you go too. You. There. I can't believe we're losing daily army XP. My god, that's so bad. And then, boom. It's not much, but it's honest work. Well, they're all attacking. I guess we all will attack as well. Why not? Zeng is driven from Jinan. Look at that. Can you just go around? Go, horses, go. Ha, oh, we got him. <laughs> nice job, guys. Oops. I guess you can do integration here, huh? Yeah, that's not one of that one, but... Victory in the League War. For many outside observers of the tumultuous Chinese situation since the 1911 Xinhai Revolution, the Chinese Nationalist Party's pursuits of national unification were thoroughly squashed with the failure of the Northern Expedition. The KMT government, which splintered into competing factions, seemed uh, destined for failure. Following the collapse of the Zile Authority in the League of Eight Provinces, followed by Black Monday, it would appear that the KMT has passed these odds and has emerged as a vibrant political force. Years of bidding their time in Europe and the Mingan insurgent zone has borne fruit as guerrilla soldiers and militia the resurgent and national revolutionary army have won victory after victory against their adversaries. With the conflict's conclusion in eastern China, the time has come to rebuild the provinces and heal from the scars of war. For observers within the international, it would appear that the sponsorship of the KMT has finally yielded its reward. As calls go not to rally the KMT movement once more to unify and save China from their strife. A second chance for the national revolution. Nice. Recovery from the League War, which really sucks for us. Add Military Affairs Commission, which really sucks for us too. Get a core on Jingling. With the victory in the League War secured, we'll lose all of our off map factors we gain from the war. Oh crap. And. Oh, yep, goodbye. Oh, it's the first repatriated Congress. Uh, after nearly a decade in exile, the K Chinese Kuomintang has passed all laws and once more established a formidable presence in the chaotic political, si political situation in China. With the success of the NRA and the League War, a call has been sent out throughout the Chinese country to rouse support for the Kuomintang's first repatriated Congress as a reunited and revived political force. Declare the national revolutionary government and prepare for one last chance for free China. No more compliance. Chinese countries can be courted upon reaching 50% compliance. The integration occupation law can be used on occupied Chinese states. Open. Having been ousted from the politics of China for more than a decade now, the Kuomintang's recent victory over its enemies in the League War has seen Sun Yat-sen's idea for a national revolution revised once more, or revived once more. Once the home of the Ming Emperor is the provisional presidential palace, which had been used as a seat of power for the Song Chuang Feng's Bang's autocratic rule for over the eight provinces, has now been renovated into the headquarters of the National Revolutionary Government. News of the Kuomintang's first repatriated Congress is beginning to spread across China. Rallying like-minded revolutionaries and kind of common goal to fulfill the dream of the Northern Expedition and create a modern and just Republic of China. In addition, a delegation from the Third International will also be in attendance of the Congress, having long pledged your support of the Kuomintang since the party's initial reorganization in 1924. The Central Committee has long played exile in Paris and owes its remarkable success to the backing of the two major syndicalist nations of Europe. The cultural entourage includes the French syndicalist advisors André Malraux and Jean Fontenay, the British advisor David Ramsey, the Indian socialist M. N. Roy, the Norwegian syndicalist Engvald Berentin Ice, and so various volunteer advisors from primarily the French and British militaries who pledged their services to develop the National Revolutionary Army, nonetheless. These foreign observers could certainly see that notable factions or cliques were beginning to form within the Congress ranks those who fought for Song Qingling's populist government and those that returned home from the Sinoclist New Order. Chairman Wang Jingwei stood behind a grandiose portrait of Sun Yat-sen flanked by a party's flags and the NRA's flag as he began, in a speech to inaugurate the Congress. 
perhaps to acknowledge the absence of the party's right wing. He started with a passionate appeal that, from a revolutionary anti-imperialist standpoint, the true revolutionaries were to come from the Kuomon things left. And thus, the first repatriated Congress began in earnest to the ecstatic revolutionary mood of Nanjing reminded many of the same patriotic fervor that had captured Wang Zhu in 1924. Let's get started right away. Nice. Oh, look at this. Unequal treaties. Oh, God. Partial mob is fine. Political advisors. We'll get there probably eventually. Oh, that's pretty, pretty good. Gu Mengyu. Hmm. It's not bad. Interesting. Political power stability. Max factory say 20%. That's pretty, that's pretty huge. Uh, Chen Bujian, Madame Wang. Interesting. Chu Min Yi. Chen Yuren. Young Guard. Huh, land action costs. Bu Butong. And Zhang Bojun. Chief of the Army, huh? Point three. The RCA is United China. Song Qingling and the PSC Asa Wing. I think I went with uh, Song Qingling last time. Third National Revolution has triumphed. Well, that's the case. Uh, naval speed. Uh, let's go over here. Uh, I want to grab somebody because we, we want more political power too, but still. Because we need army XP. What if we don't want to go down with this guy? Opponents advisor promote nonpartisanship, reducing radicalism. Maybe I want to be a radical. Restore the political departments. First part, party orthodoxy. Determine the class base of the party. The Congress's first turn was to address Kuo Ming-ting's utmost duty to uplift the oppressed workers and peasants of China. In the spirit of the first reorganization, the Kuo Ming-ting was to awaken the masses and unite together the peasants, workers, merchants, and students in order to defeat their shared enemies, the imperialists and warlords. With the unconservative elements, especially the elders of the party, the Kuo Ming-ting should represent the whole people during the National Revolution, the elder Wu, um, uh, Zi Sui. Zihui even argued that good landlords and merchants could join the revolution alongside the masses. Taking to the stand after Wang's speech, RCA members Chen Gongbu and Shi Kontong took to the floor to argue that the class, however, that was the most important question in the revolution, and the class struggle is a necessary evolution of the Chinese revolution. Citing the efforts of Song Qingling's peasants in the Mingang insurgency and strikes in 1932, Shi and Chen blasted Wu by citing a former saying that the sun in which the party's founders said the national revolution should accomplish socialism. While a definitive class base was drawn by both Song's populace and Wang's growing RCA faction in the Kuomintang, as indeed uh, henceforth be a party of workers and peasants, foreign observers, observers have certainly noticed a faction of tendencies rising beneath the facade of the party unity. The RCA, after all, believes that a revolution in cadre must lead the masses, a move that many in the Song Qingling's Provisional Action Committee may find offense at. As you do not see a revolution of the masses led by a pretentious elite, the KMT is a party of the workers and the peasants. Or, we need for us a foreign ministry. Let's get Song Fu. Chen Yuren, if higher, would greatly help our efforts in foreign diplomacy. Huh. Get weekly stability, it's not bad. There's a lot of fire, Shanghai connections. Dai Chong Feng, if higher, would greatly help our efforts in foreign espionage. Reopen the Wompa Military Academy. Um. Paternal autocracy. Should we not complete all the military reforms in this phase of the game, we'll be able to get upgrade our army in phase 3. Look to the west. Radical socialism increase. I guess the Mingan insurgency. A regular infantry attack and defense. Social democracy as well. People's war. Exception national bureaucracy. The legitimacy of the party is weak. Effective. Ooh, he probably do this one next. Revolt legislative one. Stability versus political power. Provisional legislative one. We'll do that one. The concept of legislative is yawn. Owes this up to the late Dr. Sun Yat Sen's three principles of the people that propose a separation of power into five branches, with the Yuan being the law making organ when the assembly is not in session. Since the position is still precarious, however, let us seek to legitimize the party's rule by establishing a provisional Yuan for the revolutionary government. The Phalanx Daira, an international research organization. As time has passed, it's clearly become apparent that the global revolution requires far more than just devotion to the cause. With France and Britain being the only highly developed socialist countries in the world, it's become widely accepted that they should launch a long term research aid program for other countries. And that's the so called Phalanxera International Research Organization, a branch of the Phalanxera International Program aimed at providing technological support for socialist countries all over the world. The question now is whether we should join in with this endeavor. Participation sounds quite good. We return to the reconstruction factor. Oh, we need to integrate this group. It's fine. Go ahead. Uh, we're still losing stuff every day. Dang it. The left has dominated the Central Committee. 
uh, executive committee, central executive committee. Uh, the KMT's reputation as a legitimate and heir of the Chinese Nationalist Party that collapsed in the First Northern Expedition has nonetheless attracted the interests of various centrists and liberals. These men, who tended to waver in their alignment with the Kuomintang's right and left wings prior to the expedition's failure, uh, distrust the outwardly socialist developments of the parties across the last decade. Many of the Republicans chose to flee overseas with the United States, Hawaii, and Southeast Asia, where they made up of the Overseas Commission of the Chinese Kuomintang, an extension of the Kuomintang interest far away from China itself. But primarily by Sun Fo, the son of the party's founder, the centrists have been invited to participate in the first repatriated Congress, and Sun Fo has been graciously offered a seat in the Central Executive Committee. They are also joined by the military officers who served in India during the Kuomintang's exile. Junos Zhu Yi and Fang Zhang Fakui who claim to be apolitical, although they certainly view the syndicalists as a persistent potential threat. As such, the combination of this India clique and the former overseas Chinese commission has led to the formation of the so-called Reconstruction Faction, which, based on Sun Fo's own words, is rebuild or reconstruct the KMT party without resorting to the radical methods of the reorganization. Interesting. Uh, the party influence is tracked by social liberal popularity in the party wheel. At lower levels, it helps serve as a moderating influence that reduces radicalism, but at higher levels, it will be seen as subversive and increased radicalism. Hmm. Keep watch of the party's perception of its liberal wing. Having Sun Fo's advisor will help keep the perce perceptions positive. Market liberals. Social liberals. Central committee. I'll be honest. I might want to go totals. I'll probably want to go totals for this campaign. What do we got here? Theorists, Naval Doctrine, Spirit Firepower, Council Theorists. Oh! Supporting this advisor strengthen LCS. Which one's LCS? Sort of Chinese syndicalist groups. Wait, which one's LCS? Oh, the harvest of 1936. Before the National Revolution began, the soldiers living in the Zhangji Fujian insurgent zone would assist local peasants in the autumn rice harvest. Besides serving as a practical function, reducing the burden of insurgency in Kuomintang controlled areas, this also serves as an ideological function, stressing the common ties between the party and the peasants. Uh, now, however, with the National Revolutionary Army being mobilized to fighting conventional, uh, conventional struggle, there are less hands than usual to help with agriculture in the heart of the revolution. A difficult, difficult decision needs to be made about how to best address the needs of the countryside. How to get used to these changes for the greater good? Divert new recruits to get some moral training in the ground. Ooh. <coughs> oh, here's this guy. Zhang Zhijong. Look to the west. Legacy of the Mingan insurgency. Third National Revolution has done it. Oh. Huh. You know what? So we will do that one then. We'll see what happens. You know what? First push, political commissioners, modern NRA, radical socialism, army of the revolution, the Red Napoleon. I kind of like this one. Unconventional means. Revolutionary arms. Masters of the land. Squad wise radio, radio use. Mechanized units. Titan Army Centralization. Hmm. Well, we're gonna go this way anyways. Deal with the Warlords. Rather the Military Affairs Commission, huh? That'd be pretty good to do, too. We're a bit backwards. Sentence within the League of Chinese Syndicalists. The proclamation of a new revolutionary socialist Chinese government has led to a growing sense of excitement and patriotism within the Chinese left wing. The conglomerate of the socialist thinkers, intellectuals, and writers who are not party members of the KM, uh, Chinese KMT have formed the fragile coalition of the League of Chinese Syndicalists, the largest faction which is the Chinese Syndicalist Party. <clears throat> Tensions have nonetheless begun to emerge between the LCS. Ideologically, not all socialists in the LCS adhere to the belief that China uh, is an already capitalistic society. A young generation of radical socialists called the Radical Faction of the LCS has declared that Chinese society is already in a capitalistic mode of production, and both peasants and workers are contra constrained in a system of capitalism, a system that must be destroyed by the revolution. Older conservative members of the LCS, such as Dong Bi Wu and Lin Bo Ku, the Orthodox Faction, um, and many of them, uh, oh, oh, I lost my place, I adhere to the belief that China is still a semi feudal nation. Separate from the CSP's radical and orthodox wings of the world society, a generation of old and idealistic anarchists who believe in the pro proud honest ideals of class reconciliation and universal harmony. Represented by party elders such as Li Shi Zhang, Wu Zi Hui, Zhang Renji, and Kai Yuan Pai, they absolutely abhor and fear the class conflict stoked by radical members that are those within the LCS. Under the socialist flag, we shall free China. 
Absolutely. League of Giants is in a closely zone and wielded coalition, and its influence depends on which faction dominates it. In order to increase, of increasing starting influence, the, the CSP radicals are materialists, socialist hardliners, allowing the RCA to increase the radicalism. The Royal Society is an old guard, a utopian influence that favors the PAC. Lastly, the CSP Orthodox faction is a wild card favoring a side as needed, or reducing radicalism overall. Within our own party, we have sides to pick. Wow. It's kind of radical when you think about it. I get no political power. Huh. I like extremists. Extremists are a lot of fun. These guys are what? Sit a combat with, which is not great. Um. Honestly, these guys are not bad, but we probably need some garrisons, don't we? Gary horses. There you go. Question of ethnic autonomy. Because I would really like to use these guys quite a bit. We'll train one division at a time, because we need something mobile. And you guys are a combat width, and but you guys are better. So we take you guys next to. Because you guys do you guys get any sort of benefit here? You fight Oak Tack, Hills, Mountains Defense. That actually wouldn't be bad to use, maybe too. Question of ethnic autonomy. Ethnic relations within China have not always been peaceful, but as the greater Dr. Sun Yat sen, who theorized the notion of Minzu from the three principles. Uh, the people is necessary to prevent the nation from falling into disorder and chaos. Interestingly enough, his early opinions were seemed to encourage the notion of a dominant Han ethnicity, but it's evident from his declaration of the 1924 reorganization of the KMT. Some proclaimed that the KMT's anti-imperialist mission also included securing self-determination for all domestic Minzu. But the notion of Minzu itself is disputed by Sun considers the great races of Qing China, aside from the Han majority, the Tibetans, Mongols, uh, Manchus, and Hui as mere relics of an ancient social structure. Instead, the late premier stance was that the Minzui, Minzu of China were all subordinate to ethnically dominant Hanzu, Han ethnicity. It was therefore the more cultured and sophisticated Hanzu's destiny to lead the Minzu into the evolutionary formation of a single Han Zhonghua Minzu. And the National Revolution, all notions of self-determination, were to be suspended until the period of tutelage is passed as the country's Minzu are merely inept to rule themselves. The Patriotic Congress, in particular Zheng, uh, Wang Jingwei's faction, as mostly in favor of following Sun's principles, nonetheless, the Provisional Action Committee has voiced openly that they would be more than happy to promise a, self -degree, a degree of self-autonomy for the minorities, um, provided the support of the KMT, of course. While Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission has been formed, the official doctrine of the State Department is to train these peoples to adopt the revolutionary spirit of the superior Hans Zhu Kuomintang. But until the warlords and imperialists have been comprehensively defeated, the question of ethnic minorities should remain indisputably answered by only the Kuomintang. We'll give it some thought. We'll let you know later what we think. But yeah, let's do that one then. Power to the United Front. League of Chinese Syndicalists, huh? League of Chinese Syndicalists. Zongguo, Guang Tuang Zui, Zhu Yi, Tong Meng. More syndicalism here. Tender to the masses. Give us different effects depending on whether or not we've adv had advisors appointed Zhang Bojun and Shi Kong Tong. Okay, both advisors give an additional effect. Promote revolutionary culture. Oh, that's really good. Liberation of the Chinese women. It's not bad. For my land distribution. Just by reconstruction efforts. Closing of the Congress. <clears throat> After several long weeks of deliberations, the first repatriated Congress of the KMT have finally adjourned. Although much has been decided upon, there are plenty left unresolved and subtle fractures that have begun to form between Wang's loyalists and the divided opposition. In the meantime, as delegates and representatives paper prepare to head home, they have decided to entrust the third and latest Central Executive Committee to manage party affairs. Headed by Chairman Wang Jingwei and Vice Chairman Liao Zongkai, the two are joined by 22 others, Bai Yunti, Chen Gongbo, Chen Yoren, Deng Yanda, Dong Bi Wu, Gu Meng Yu, Li Jieshan, Lo, Lin Bo Ku, oh my god, Lang Hong Kao, Pan, and a bunch of other guys uh, over here too. Given, discipl given disciplinary powers, and with say over financial affairs, the Central Advisory Committee, made up of commenting stalwarts, Kai Yuan Pai, Li Shizhen, uh, Wu Zihui, Zhu Yixian, and Zhang Ranji. Both committees have also extensive and carefully negotiated alternative member rosters. A delicate balance of power has been established, uh, with Wang and his RC carefully moving to consolidate his government without provoking excessive backlash from those increasingly antagonized by his efforts to assert his authority. Perhaps the best encapsulating the emerging power games being played is Wang's decision to appoint Sun Fo as Vice Premier of the Executive Yuan, a new prestigious but rather powerless position, <clears throat> to help remove a arrival from loyalist Chen Gongbo's bid to become Premier of the Legislative Yuan. Although the full cabinet is yet to be named, Song Qingling and her pack allies are said to be already grumbling about a lack of representation, feeling deliberately locked out. However, it's unlikely they can do much to contest the president's appointments. Or can they? The left KMT balance power mechanics is fairly straightforward. 
and that measures the relative influence of the two major parties, Wang's RCA and Song PACs, depending on which side has advantage after transunification. A scenario will play out that will allow one or the other to consolidate the power. Shifting the balance too far on one side will destabilize the revolution, but be warned, if neither side has a clear advantage, a third scenario might emerge. Oh, I like the sound of that. Balance of power. So, oh, I've done this before. Dom is the acting committee, huh? Weekly stability goes way down. Dom is the real guns comrades. Weekly stability goes way down. Because right now we're here. Political advisor gain. Political power gain. Advisor cost goes down. Huh. Radicalism within the party will increase by a medium amount. Intimidate the opposition. Radicalism within the party will increase by medium amount. I like radicalism. Hunan seeks an alliance. Hunan, led by the old Buddhist commander Tang Chengzi, is requested to join a faction. Though some are hesitant to giving Tang's frequent clashes with the nationalist general Cheng Qian, members of the Grimmer Lodge are sympathetic to Tang Shangxi. And they're social democrats. They're not, not great, but. You know what? Sure, why not? You may join us. Oh, they actually changed colors too. That's really cool. Of course. Oh, well, let's look at this. Chinese unification. Central authority in China has long eroded. It's decades of foreign imperialism, political instability, and domestic unrest in light of imperial weakness spawned a new class of regional militarists in the ailing days of the old Qing Empire. The Junai Revolution brought further tumult to the nation. As revolutionary generals seized control of the numerous provinces and set about building complex networks of military officers, allied businessmen, landed gentry, sympathetic intelligentsia, and government officials. Nevertheless, a common actual national identity remains, as various uh, movements across the land have made their bid to unite the nation and rebuild China in their image, taking advantage of their own patronage networks. Foreign at support and growing art armies, the clash for influence in the cities and countryside still on the twisting and turning realities of warlord China. Open warfare is not only this uh, it's not the only this conflict develops. Huh. Tales of shifting alliances and sordid betrayal unfold all the while a foreign invasion looms. Increase integration from Oh, we just got this. A lot of the leadership in Changsha has thankfully seen wisdom and decided to align themselves with us. Let's go further. We're to truly end the warlord era. Efforts will be made to bring the Hunanese administration closer to our own. Okay, left campaign attempts to increase integration. There's a 69% chance to refuse. Nice. Influence factors. Government type, total number of governance, relative army strength, relative industrial strength, opinion. If they refuse, Hunan becomes free. Oh, we get claim. And we can just go straight to war with them. Interesting. Oh my god. Outer factions of the revolution. Although the KMT principle of Dang Guo insists on a one party state, in practice, the KMT has long been divided into factions. Even as the RCA and the PAC slug it out for dominance, smaller groups pursue their own agendas and vie for influence. Uh, the stronger each are, the more impact they will have in deciding the uh, victor of the revolution, uh, revolution long power struggle. The Reconstruction uh, faction represents a rump liberal blo bloc within the party. Their insistence on constitutionalism and moderation is endeared some, but detracted the accusations of being a front for the meddling of the urban or overseas elite. Depending on the prevailing attitude towards them, supporting them may decrease or increase radicalism. Moderating force. The League of China syndicalists are an unwieldy coalition of socialists on the United Front within the KMT. Internally, they are fiercely divided, with the CSP radical faction aligning with the RFC and the World Society harshly opposing them. This leaves a, co a compromise, our CSP Orthodox faction acts as a wild card, hoping to keep the balance. Jesus Christ. A shattered cabal of ultra-nationalistic, radicalized army officers known as the China Revival Society lurk in the darkness. Alienated from the political process as radicalism rises, and the ranks as well swell, so it is a threat of a terrible fate for the revolution. Secure donations. That's kind of cool. These are underground networks, we'll talk about this later. Ooh. Ooh. Well, what about this? Out of the collapse of the Northern Expedition, many of the National Revolutionary Officers uh, went underground in this time. The lines between rebellion and crime are often blurred, with the Kwai Montang smuggling networks frequently overlapping with organized crime, even as we transition towards a more legitimate uh, mode of governance. <clears throat> the realities of warming that weapons procurement is often an unsavory business, tapping into the connections we have and building more than might mean the difference between a new China and a broken dream. Interesting. Stoke military fanaticism. Oh, so you can slowly increase all the uh, fun stuff here, huh? More totalism, this political part, get more division attack, which means nothing when you're not at war. I get more army XP, though. And more war support, actually, that's pretty good. Ever since uh, the first days of Wampoa, the National Revolutionary Army has been trained to use 
to be utterly and fanatically loyal to the party and the revolutionary cause. Thus, fanaticism separated it from the warlords that fought. And the Wang Po myth began with the Battle of Mian Hu during the Eastern Expedition against Chen Jiang Ming's forces. At number 20 to 3, two regiments of the Wang Po graduates suffered nearly 70% casualties in the battle, but nonetheless carried the day, routing their opponents. It is just. <clears throat> As important to keep the Wampo spirit alive, breeding the revolutionary enthusiasm that has created countless martyrs and heroes over the decades. United in fraternity, devotion, and sincerity, we march forward to national salvation, the China Revival Society. As Kuomintang representatives assembled in politics in Nanjing, plenty left outside uh, the negotiating table found time to gather on their own. Away from the pol public spotlight, a different set of those ideas and ideals swirled. Many disaffected Wampo alumni, stewing their exile far from home across the last decade, had gathered together within the academy's tightly woven networks. The more ideological and radical is bunched into He Zonggang and Wang, uh, Deng Wang Yi, mid level staff officers who promote a national sectoralist and anti establishment line. Having returned, they are proudly begun calling their secret fraternity the Revolutionary Army Commerce Association, Raka, a secret circle within a larger secret circle. The university presented their ideas before. Hu Zong Nan, the director of Wang Po's training department, and other sympathetic commanders in the backroom meeting. Although short in stature, Hu was one of the eldest of uh, the Wang Po's first graduating class, age 28 in 1924, and a favorite of the former headmaster who preferred Zhang natives, elements he was exploited to assert an air of authority over many of his peers and students. To the delight of the attendees, uh, Hu gave his approval for the Raka's agenda before the uh, uh, fellow young guard officers um, and formally accepted his role as uh, their Ling uh, Ling Yu. In his speech, the general swore to ensure the Chinese Revolution would never again be the victim of foreign imperialists or petty infighting. Wielding the Oraka, the League of Ten, and other radical officers together into one fighting movement, the China Revival Society is born. A revolution from within? Radicalism within the party will increase by medium amount. Radicalism within the KMT will rise and fall depending on the choices. This is primarily the benefit of the total CRS, and should radicalism percentage be greater than the strength of the winner's balance power, a remaining scenario for China to activate upon unification. Oh. Look at that. Rally industrial workers. There's that one. Secure international technical aid. Sponsor cultural institutions. That's cool too. <sighs> We're still losing stuff every day, dang it. Actually, which, what direction are they going? Syndicalists? Oh, they went totalists. And. They went radical socialists. Interesting. Oh. Huh. So you tell me, we increase our opinion of them here. Save the textile industries. We could demobilize our economy, but why would I do that? 64%? Seven cops declares a Russian state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sounds about right. The show all Oh, God. Um, you got a beard, so you can do that. There you go. Where are they at now? 37% chance of refusing. Just straight up get them as a puppet. Nice. Well, we want to get down here. I want the research slot, so establish a national bureaucracy. And this wouldn't be bad, too. Oh, we can support the revolution in China. Let me do this one first. In order to achieve international recognition with not just the nations of the world, but also the Chinese expatriate diaspora, we are to establish a former ministry of the party to propagate our ideals and our mission to the world. Furthermore, let us reach to the oppressed peoples of Asia to look to our revolution as inspiration for carrying out their own national liberation. Which is not great for this other stuff, but radicalism will decrease a tiny bit, uh, which is not great, but our Shanghai connections will be good too. Dai Chong Feng. Yeah. So, how do we do any of this stuff? Reinforce. Oh, we have to do these different uh, missions. Courage political commissars. Yeah. Commissars and underground networks. So we get another military off map military factory, which would be nice too. As much as I want that that one. Friends on the other side, huh? Years ago, just outside of the Ling Yin Temple near Hangzhou, a young man was bathing naked on the banks of the West Lake. A pack of nearby school children rushed over to take his discarded clothing, only to be stopped by the young teacher who noticed a bather lacked swimwear. The bather thanked the teacher, and both men readily became friends. Both grew up in Zhejiang, were trained to be educators, and above all, shared an ambition to have more in life. That is a fanciful story Dai Chung Feng tells people for how he was re rescued from embarrassment by Hu Zonggang. Zongnang. Although each went their separate ways afterwards, they coincidentally found each other again a few years later in Wampoa, a protege of another Xinjiang native, Chiang Kai shek 
who would graduate, die, never finish his coursework, and both parted after 1927, only once become uh, once more find another after the fall of the league. The years after have taken a toll on both men, um, hardly a year spent from one another. Neither feel that they receive the respect they deserve in the wake of the league war. Die in particular is furious that despite his dangerous intelligence work performed during the war, no one is respectable is willing to associate with them. Except, it would appear that for General Hu Zongnang, as director of the training department, who has managed to retroactively secure Dai a diploma from Wampoa and formal membership into the Kuomintang, the ambitious general has recruited Dai to his personal staff, giving the man shelter from any reprisals for his work with Qi Ji Yuan. The two men have allowed to become blood brothers, hatching back from schemes for the future. A shadowy pact. Okay. Do they like us? Do they love us? Legislative one. Although the KMT and vanguardist fashion maintains the party protects presidents of the state for the duration of the political tutelage, the conquest of Nanjing means that the party is forced to contend with the realities of governance. It set the groundwork for Dr. Sun's vision. A provisional legislative uh, one has been established, still subordinate and status of the Kuomintang National Congress and the Central Executive Committee. The exact relationship between this government parliamentary body and the party organs is still in flux. Despite the junior status, this unicameral legislature is not totally powerless, meeting regularly, unlike the party congress, and appealing to the intellectuals. Naturally, of course, RCA members hold a thin majority seat, albeit divided between radical and moderates. Other KMT seats have been given to the PAC and RF, as well as a few old guard members. Considerably give fewer are being given to the United Front. The largest being the CSP joined by the few allied independents, the Danghua. The premier of the legislative one is Cheng Gongbo. The de facto leader of the RCA, thanks to some careful horse treating, the RF has brokered deals, key deals, to secure for themselves to offer other high positions in the Yuan, yielding any claim to the premiership, most notably securing longtime Sun Fo loyalist Wang. Kunling as Vice Premier and Liang Hanak Hankao as Secretary General. Outflanked by the savvy RCA, the PAC's Coxa by Zhang Bojun and Peng Zhi, uh, Ziang have scrambled to rally an unofficial opposition bloc to prevent total RCA dominance. They do so will require aligning the CSP and chipping off some RCA moderates, while also securing a deal of their own with the RF and Old Guard, after a series of secretive uh, midnight meetings, and a court is struck. Social conservatism, the influence of the world society will rise among cynical circles. And it, Accord remains elusive towards a reorganized commerce association. Radicalism within the party was increased by a small amount. We don't want that one. Well, we do get that one for, for both of them. Undermine the chairman's grip. So right now we're here. We want to move it further to the left. So we're going to lose it anyway. 26%. 14%. There you go. Reorganized commerce tilt. Oh, we lost a slight bit of political power. Oh, we're actually losing political power. That's not good. Um, hmm. I'm oh, trying to integrate the Jinan arsenal too, so that doesn't help. We're showing a connection. That'd be pretty good to do too. But we need to establish a national bureaucracy. Well, while the party's late founder Dun Sun, Doctor Sun, <laughs> envisioned that there would be a necessary stage of late of the party state and tutelage, we must undertake efforts to legitimize our control of the former league. Until the country is reunified, we'll have to hold off on drafting constitution. Nonetheless, an organic law should be passed to govern in a constitution instead, ushering in a return of a formal executive young. Oh wait, this one gives him more political power. But we get, get growing, so... Should be okay. Oh. Oh, Long Yun is in Yunnan. Of course he would be. Um, let's see. As a common thing center, civilian faction has always had a complicated relationship with the left. When the Western Hills Conference was first held in opposition to the reorganization and later Dun's Dr. Dr. Sun's alliance with the Internationale, Sun Fo and Squeak was initially open to joining with other right-wingers, but ultimately was cowed by the growing influence of Wang Jingwei. Since then, they have mostly acted on the sidelines, serving as a more pliant, or pliant internal opposition for the RCA that Wang can compromise with to demonstrate his statementship while containing the PAC. Still, that does not stop Dr. Uh, Sun Fo from openly criticizing the government or continuing to champion his relatively liberal views influenced uh, by his education in the United States. The PSC have made repeated overtures to the Reconstruction faction, but with the RF's growing internal cloud, it appears that the old iron neck has begun flying a bit too close to the sun and passing himself as a genuinely primary alternative to Wang's leadership. If that's the case, a harsh reality check is soon to come. Outside of the government halls and the party elders, the RF finds very little popular support and a growing chorus of opponents that condemn them for selling out the revolution to the bourgeoisie. The only question is whether or not this announcement will drag down the rest of the party leadership with them. Radicalism will increase. The influence of the liberal or reconstruction faction has grown too high to be compatible with the socialist revolution. Keeping socialist liberal popularity low, or hiring some foes advisors will help improve the internal perception of this faction. But be warned that if influence continues to go unchecked, radicalism will only increase. We're on to them now. Well, 18% chance. 
when Sinek in a hole. As the ranks of the syndicalists grow, the League of Chinese Syndicalists has become more and more divided. The original League was founded by the Chinese Syndicalist Party as a means of consolidating non kuomintang socialists together within the confines of the United Front, as part of a deliberate strategy to maintain leverage in negotiations with a senior partner. This means that a desperate coalition of Marxists, anarchist syndicalists, and other leftists, would otherwise never have any chance of power on the original United Front, were brought under the shaky banner. Now, the League suffers from their own success. With all their hard work and sacrifices potentially undone, the League falls into to find a direction soon. Like the KMT, the libertarian promises of Utopia have been largely confined to rhetoric for the duration of the tutelage. The Orthodox faction uh, and the Chinese Syndicalist Party is effectively built on being compatible with the United Front, and willing to work closely, albeit independently, with the KMT. They envision a future compromise system of both union-based and council-based democracy, a platform that has come under increasing scrutiny as the flaws of the French system become more apparent. The younger generation of the CSP, often known as the radicals, are Marxists in by orientation. Less concerned than the orthodox peers about democracy in the near term, they see unions as a mean to an end, a way of empowering the proletariat to be eventually discarded in favor of a council-based system of representation. Outside the CSP is the Royal Society, the continuation of the older Chinese anarchist movement. Utopian by nature, they, their members are heavily integrated into the KMT, and see a future where the League is folded in, into by their party leader, uh, senior party. To them, the tutelage is only temporary, and afterwards the KMT, under Royal Society influence, will march on to a harmonious free future. The radicalism of the party will be increased by a small amount, will rise, Maintain the orthodox state compromise. Cultivate the idealism of the free world. Of the world society. Oh, we gotta go with that one, you know? We gotta go with that one. The Korean National Revolutionary Party. As part of the Chinese Kuomintang's commitment to not just national revolution, but also liberation, liberation for the rest of the Asian peoples from the imperialism, uh, a culture tie has been established between the Kuomintang and the Korean National Revolutionary Party. Formed by the Korean exiles in China, led by Kim Wong Bong, the Korean revolutionary joined the Guangpo Academy shortly before the Northern Expedition. The KNRP claims to be the sister party of the KMT. As a Korean nationalist party, the KNRP is a generally socialist party that also professes to adapt and follow the three principles of the people. As the Korean people, like the Chinese people, are oppressed and live under the chains of Japanese imperialism, the bonds between the two nations are strong. As the conflict between the Empire of Japan and a nationalist like China seems inevitable, many Korean expatriates believe that they, by working with the Chinese, they may one day achieve independence with Chinese help. That being said, Performal orders to the NRA, Kim Wong Bong's uh, rank, and status have been restated as an official soldier within the NRA. He commands the Korean Liberation Army, a battalion of equally patriotic Korean volunteers, including a young Cheng Chiu Bu, with a grand goal that one day may, they may return to Korea's liberators. We salute our Korean comrades. Security National Technical Aid. Secure OCC donations. The revolution and nation often make for strange bedfellows. Despite our socialist ideals, there are many wealthy sympathizers willing to provide lavish donations for a cause, either out of a nationalistic desire to cast out foreign imperialism, or perhaps out of endearing themselves to our administration. Most are affiliated with either the Legations Base for Million Society or with the Overseas Chinese Commission, based in the wealthy Chinese expatriate communities in Southeast Asia and the United States. Indeed, quite a few leading KMT figures were born to such families such as Song Po, Cheng Yoren, and Chen Bijou. While might not always see eye to eye, they surely hope. Uh, they surely hope our leftist beliefs are simply a phase, and donations we receive are very real. Do you increase radicalism? Oh, uh, when selected, you get one. 400 days, you lose that. And when removed, you lose it. So it's one way to increase radicalism, I guess. Hmm. Or we can just use this one. Oh, well, I guess we have to you remove it anyways. Huh. Effects when removed. Well, that's one way to do that. And remove it. I prefer this one. Encourage political commis uh, commissars. Where is that? Commissars. Oh, it's here. It doesn't really matter which one. Legacy of the Mingan Insurgency. Olgar prevails. Dang Yanda gets. Field Marshal and Politically Connected versus Look to the West. Um, I kind of prefer that one, in all honesty. Trying for the Young Guard. We like him young. Modern NRA seems pretty good, too. Army of the Revolution sounds like more fun, though. The Red Napoleon sounds like a lot of fun. Unconventional means. I don't know, we'll figure that out next time. We can reopen it anyways. Uh, yeah. But I want this one. We gotta race towards that one. We gotta do this one too. Um, while seen as a high mark, water mark of the Western Imperialism in China, Shanghai is home to thousands of workers and gangsters who are sympathetic to the pursuit of the National Revolution. It's also the state in which many of the party fled after too, if, after the failure of the Northern Expedition. Where their position in the Chinese Eastern Seaboard secured us to reestablish these connections in the Pearl of the East. So we'll see what happens. We're gonna do this one. You increase uh, radicals and up oh, by a tiny amount. And transigent fools, huh? Huh, that's funny. 41% here, huh? Secure aid. 
Oh, support the revolution in China. China the Chinese were not only the victims of imperialism. Across the continent, the rapacious expansion of the European Empire swallowed free nations. So, subjecting millions of brutal colonial rules to the East, the Japanese have joined in with the oppressors racing the, to plant their own flag in the outside soil. It's our duty as a natural protector of Asia to free all peoples across the land. Through our spirit, our blood, and our necessary guile, we shall shatter the grip of imperialist powers both at home and abroad. In the meantime, we shall help elevate the national consciousness of Asian peoples, help them share in the glory of the Pan-Asian socialism. Uh, if we, our subjects, own Canton or Dali, and have the required equipment, we will have additional options for supply shipments. The heroic peoples of the Nunu China rose up rose against their German occupiers. The Germans come to replace the French after the Great War improved a little better, forcing the natives to toil on their plantations while capitalists exploit all the profits. It's from this foothold and others that the Germans continue to expand their presence, into the British colonies post-collapse and then into China in 1927. Should revolutionary groups succeed here, it would be a devastating blow to German prestige and help avenge the intervention in the Northern Expedition. Why not? Oh god. What happens for the Indo Chinese Revolution? The brave rebels of the nations of Indochina are fighting courageously against the vile German East Asian imperialists. With a position in Eastern China secure, it's high time we support our revolutionary comrades. After all, the German intervention in 1927 showed more than anything that our struggles are connected. The Viet Minh are a coalition of desperate socialist groups united under one banner, and there have been uh, different points of contact <coughs> uh, throughout the years. Several uh, attended Wang Po, for example, and a few dozen even followed us in the Mingan insurgency. Others were trained by our officers in India during the exile period. On a civilian level, their chapters are scattered throughout Southeast Asia, some of their own diaspora networks, and there is frequent contact between them. The practical element of supporting them is more of a challenge. The Indo Chinese revolutionaries have sympathetic contacts among civilian shipping, which have allowed them to partially evade the German East Asian naval blockade, which usually by first sending equipment to Bangkok and then smuggling it over land to rebel held territories. If we pull our resources within our OCC contacts in Southeast Asia, we might be able to get a few shipments through, though it would be dangerous if and not all will make it. Owning ports closer to the region would be a great advantage, most notably Guangzhou. Given uh, the extensive trade that flows in to and from there, it would be much easier and cheaper to smuggle in equipment that, and we could send far more of it. Access to the Siamese territory through the border with Yunnan would also be advantageous. Its poor nature combined with the Siamese disdain for their neighbors has allowed for overland smuggling trails from to Indochina from the north as well. All in all, it's our duty to support revolutionary comrades, though perhaps it simply isn't the right time. Smuggle what arms we can. Equipment will be understood by German authorities, corrupt local leaders, unless we are allies on Canton or Dali. So we'll do what we can here, but it is what it is. But if you enjoyed the first episode, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. Let's continue on and see what else we can do with the National Revolutionary Government. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.